Okay, so hi everyone. So uh, welcome to our meetup. We are uh, a Tunis R user group. Sorry. So uh, Tunis R user group aims to provide a friendly support network for R enthusiasts in Tunisia and worldwide. We are women who love R programming language. <laughs> we are really addicted to R, and we are a group of volunteer running, you know, Tunis R user group. So Tunis R user group uh, was founded by Muna Belaid, which is a business intelligence consultant, uh, Amal Klili, which is a data scientist engineer, and myself. I'm a bioinformatician and I will be your host today. And we are very happy and honored to have with us and uh, a new member in our team. So Amal, please say hi to everyone. So Amal is a bioinformatician and a PhD student at the National Institute for Agri Agriculture Research of Tunisia. So Hello, everyone. Also we'll be co-organizing the bioinformatics events. So now everyone knows Amal. And she will be also, if you have any question, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat. And Amal will be really happy to, re to re respond. OK, so we have also a code of conduct. So Tunis our user group is uh, dedicated to be providing a respectful, harassment-free community for everyone. So we do not tolerate harassment or bullying of any community member in any form. And uh, let's keep this place, you know, welcoming and friendly community for everyone, where everyone can uh, can learn, you know, and we can learn from each other, and we and be kind, you know, to each other. So here we have our previous meetups in YouTube. So if you want to learn about our previous meetup, for example, we had uh, like an introduction to proteomic uh, data visualization, uh, data science, please go to our YouTube channel and you will find all our previous meetups. So today we will be uh, learning about uh, so how to conduct the genome White Association uh, study using uh, GAPIT. So it's an introductory session to uh, GWAS. And we are very, very happy to have with us uh, Andy Chen. So Andy, thank you uh, for being our um, guest today and for like teaching us, you know, it's like a GWAS and for accepting our invitation. So let's uh, introduce Andy. Andy is an aspiring plant breeder with a master degree in plant genetics and breeding from the University of Guelph, where he studied uh, there. And he developed a new phenotyping method and identified genetic markers that could improve the winter hardness of uh, winter wheat uh, using GWAS. He is currently a final year PhD student at the Jonin Center in the UK, working with Professor Christoval Wall. Andre's uh, current research focuses on utilizing genomic resources to identify wheat genes and new variations that can improve yield, agronomic performance, and end use quality. So, thank you, Andy, for. Um, teaching all these amazing things today. And so before we start, if you have a comment question, please uh, leave uh, your message in YouTube or here now. So we will tackle all the questions at the end of the session since we are many people and many participants. So Andy yeah, can show us, you know, it's like, and he can, yeah, it's like, uh, so G was, and we can learn from him all these exciting things. And before you leave, well, uh, we had before like a short feedback form that we will send it to you, you know, after the meetup. And then all, you know, it's like this meetup and uh, this Zoom wouldn't have been possible without our partner and sponsor, Epsilon. So Epsilon sponsored our uh, Zoom. 
And we are really happy to have them as our collaborator and sponsor. So please uh, visit Epsilon's blog and YouTube channel too to learn about uh, shiny dashboard, data science, machine learning. Uh, and uh, so they they have many, you know, it's like teaching material about like R, machine learning, data science. I myself joined them many times to learn lots of exciting things about R. And thank you very much, everyone. So Andy, uh, so the screen is yours. I will stop sharing my screen. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so, if you, so hi, everyone. My name is Andy. Um, uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming out. So, sorry, my computer is a little slow at the moment. I'm just going to give it a second. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. So again, my name is Andy, and uh, today I'll be running a brief workshop on Genoa Association study today. And uh, thank you again to the Tunis R user group for the invitation today, specifically to Mo and Hadia for the invitation. It's, it, really, it really is a privilege um, to be here today. So in fact, I was in um, Tunisia about a few months ago, and that's when I met uh, Amo during uh, one of the workshops that we we're running there. And so it's, it's great to be able to uh, be invited back again. Uh, so like what Dio was saying, if you have any question, uh, please do leave them in the chat. We'll try to address them at the end uh, because uh, today we have a lot of participants. So it might be disruptive if we try to address them uh, during the workshop. A little bit about myself. Uh, so I'm a four year PhD student at the John Innes Center. And then I grew up in Canada. So as some of you might know, Canada has some of the toughest winter. And uh, so whenever we grow winter wheat, there's a high risk of uh, winter kill, uh, which can then lead to a reduction in yield and production and making winter wheat a very risky uh, production in Canada. So one of my goals for my master's program is I then perform genome association study in order to identify genetic loci that is associated with winter survival in winter weeds in Canada. And as part of my PhD, I continue to perform genome-wide association study to identify beneficial allele for agronomic traits and weeds. Uh, so these uh, are looking at more spike phenotype, number of grains produced per spike, spike length, and so forth. So I have quite some experience uh, with running, uh, applying uh, GWAS and identify um, genetic loci that can influence on the traits that we are interested in looking at. Uh, so me personally, I'm a wheat scientist. So um, just, just, I just want to get an idea whether or not what crops people work on or what species people work on. So if you can put in to chat what kind of species you work on, then I can kind of talk about some of them a little bit throughout my presentation. Let me take a quick look. Okay, so we got some barley people in here. Oh, Drosophila soybean sesame. Okay, wow. Weeds, okay. Weeds, a human traits, okay. Uh, agave, oh, wow. Uh, so yeah, so I can see we have quite a bit of diversity in terms of the species that we work on. Um, so today, most of the examples I'm going to use is going to be on weeds, uh, but, um, but most of these are very universal. You can apply it to any other species uh if you want to as well so that's not that's not definitely not a limitation so the point of this workshop is uh an introductory section of of GWAS I want to be able to give you some of the information some theory behind GWAS right so uh, what are some of the basic theory uh how do you conduct GWAS what are some useful software uh, that you can use and also, even if you don't conduct GWAS, how do you interpret GWAS result? There's a lot of GWAS study that are currently being published in publication. How do you evaluate whether or not these results are reliable? How do you interpret them? And also, what is next? Well, what do you do after you have your GWAS results? And what are some other potential strategy that you can use in order to uh, achieve your objective uh, in addition of performing genome-wide association study? And after the theoretical session, we're gonna run a quick practical session uh, using GAPIT. And the reason why I pick GAPIT is because this is a R group. So we, I, I pick a cap uh, a package 
that runs very well in R and that I have personally used and that I personally enjoy using as well. And then usually when you use Gapit, um, you can just run it on your computer. It doesn't take that much computing power. So it's, a, it's quite a user-friendly software for, for people that are in, interested in getting into GWAS. Okay. So essentially, uh, GWAS is an observational study to dissect the genetic architecture of complex traits. So these are usually continuous phenotypes such as height, flowing time, and spike length. So we're trying to identify the genetic marker at which the variation in genotype is significantly associated with the variation in phenotype. So for example, if you have an A allele for this marker, you have earlier flowing time, and for the G allele, uh, you flower later. So by identifying these marker trait association, you expect it to get a better understanding of how your trait of interest is a control. Uh, so which chromosome region are control of trait of interest? And do these regions have a big effect or small effect in our trait of interest? And later on, this information can also help you develop genetic markers, which can then uh, improve your trait of interest in your breeding program via market-assisted selection or backcrossing. And also with more genomic resources, such as what we're seeing in wheat right now, uh, and more validation tool becoming available, uh, these information can also help support the identification of the underlying gene for a trait of interest. So there's some milestone in GWAS. So GWAS was first developed in the context of human disease genetic in the mid 1990s. So for people uh, that have done uh, or that have done or have heard of 23andMe, sometimes they will give you how likely you are to have dark hair or whether or not you're gonna like couscous. So some of these readout read out are in fact uh, based on the results from genome-wide association study. And the first GWA study was published in 2002 uh, in human and then for plant 2005. But since the establishment of this method has been widely adopted in the plant community. Uh, so this part looks at the number of maize GWAS study that has been published since 2009, uh, which I think was the release time of their reference genome. And as of 2020, there has been over 200 publications for GWAS for various traits in wheat. So yeah, so GWAS is quite a widely adapted tool uh, for, for plant genomic studies. So before we get into GWAS, I will get into some of the other methods uh, that have been used in the past or are used currently to identify genetic region affecting our trade of interest. Uh, so the first people that uh, most people commonly use or, or maybe you have personally used yourself uh, to identify genes that affect our trade is QTO mapping or linkage analysis. Essentially, QTO or quantitative trade loci are genetic regions uh, in which the allele can affect the variation of a quantitative traits. So in QTO mapping, we test for a co-segregation of the genetic polymorphism with our trail of interest. So in, I'm gonna use an example here. We usually have a, a biparental population. So in this example, we have parent one and parent two. So parent one has brown leaf and parent two has green leaf. And DNA segment from parent one is represented by orange and the DNA segment from parent two is represented by blue. And essentially, in our example, we want to identify the QTO that can affect leaf color. So we first make a cross between parent one and parent two. And at the eighth generation, we can then combine the genotypic information and the phenotypic information to locate the regional chromosome that control of trail of interest. So in this scenario, so you pay attention, uh, uh, any, any plant that has the parent two, the blue segment at the top of the chromosome has green leaf, right? So here, green, 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 green. Whereas if you have the orange segment, uh, you have brown leaf, brown, 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 brown. brown. Uh, so in, in this case, we can therefore, we can see this close association between this chromosome segment with our trail of interest. And therefore we can conclude that the genes that control leaf color must be in this region uh, of, of, of the chromosome. And more or less, the resolution of our mapping is dependent on the amount of recombination that happens. So in this case, uh, we have an F2 generation. So we have one generation 
of recombination. So there's not as much recombination. So you're gonna you're gonna get big chromosome chunk from each parent. So in this case, when you do the mapping, you're not gonna get uh, uh, as much of a resolution as in comparison to F8, where you have several rounds of recombination, and now we have smaller fragments uh, of parental DNA being recombined between each progeny. So where so this will allow us to uh, locate the region of our interest into a smaller chromosome region. So for linkage analysis, resolution is really dependent on the number of recombination that you can have. So essentially, genome-wide association study, uh, it, the goal is, is pretty much the same, right? So we want to identify the genetic region that is associated uh, with our trade of interest. And this can be disease resistance, uh, such as septoria, or resistance such to abiotic stress, such as tolerance to drought, tolerance to heat, which I know is a really big problem in Tunisia. So, and GWAS, usually instead of using a biparental population, they use a diverse collection of material uh, to, to perform. And GWAS, so diverse collection. So for example, here you can see a diverse collection. And GWAS has uh, several as advantage. First of all, uh, it has higher resolution. Here again, we have an example of the F2 of uh, biparental population for link linkage mapping, where it only has one generation of recombination. So for our result, you usually find a large section of chromosome co-segregating with our trait of interest. But in GWAS, you can make use of a diverse collection of germplasm, which over the span of time has accumulated a lot of a lot of different recombination uh, across uh, the genome, which will then give you a higher resolution, meaning a smaller genetic region that as to where the as to, to where your underlying gene uh, can control your phenotype might be. So that's one of the advantage of genome wide association study, right? Higher resolution, and often it can also reduce time for material generation. So, for example, if you're doing linkage mapping, you might need to get a recombinant embryo line to F6 or F8, which will take many years. Whereas in GWAS, you can potentially get your materials from the gene bank and then have one generation to bulk up these seeds, and the next generation, you, you're ready uh, to, to phenotype your material. So it can potentially reduce time for material generation. So GWAS associated mapping is also dependent, uh, it's very dependent on the strength of linkage disequilibrium, which is a very important concept, concept for uh, making these marker trait association. Um, so it's very dependent on this linkage disequilibrium or LD between the marker and the functional polymorphic, polymorphism across a set of diverse germplasm. So LD or can be interpreted as the um, non-random association between two or more loci in a population. So in general, but not always, it is dependent on the function of distance. How close are they physically in the chromosome? So here we have an example of two markers, marker one, marker two, and they're in linkage equilibrium, they're in LE. They're not associated with one another. So if you have blue in the first one, you can either get black or white, right? Uh, and you have red in the second one, you can also either get black or white. And whereas if you have two markers that are in linkage disequilibrium and LD, if you have blue in the first one, you have more, you're more likely to see uh, black in your second marker. And whereas if you have red in the first marker, you have, uh, you're more likely get, to get white markers. So where we see this non-random association uh, between marker one and marker two. So this is a very important concept, uh, which is a core idea behind the association study with GWAS. Because more often than not, unless you do whole genome sequencing, which is uh, which can be quite expensive, you will not be able to capture all the polymorphism. But as long as you have a good spread of your marker, you're expecting that a genotype SNP right, right here is in linkage disequilibrium with the actual causal SNP, which is right here, but it's not genotype. So this will still allow you to detect your genetic region of interest, even if the causal SNP is not genotype. As long as you have a good spread of marker across um, uh, your panel, it should be okay. 
So therefore, one of the main consideration when you're conducting GWAS is your marker coverage. And this can, uh, of course, depend on different kinds of plants that you're working with. Uh, so in the chat, I can see like many people, there are many, there are many uh, people are working on different crops. Some people are not even uh, working on Drosophila or in human, but let, let's use maize as an example. Maize is an outcrossing, right? So you're expecting uh, more recombination and therefore you're expecting that the LD block to be smaller, uh, usually around 100 kilobase. So LD block is kind, uh, so another way to think of LD block is a region of genomic uh, genetic variants that are inherited together as a unit, uh, just most likely due to how close they are to one another. So in wheat or barley, so I see a few people that also work on wheat or barley because it is self-pollinating species. Our LD block is typically bigger, right? So it can, depending on where it is in the chromosome, it can range from one to five million base pair. So you might need a higher marker coverage uh, for a species such as maize in comparison to wheat, which, is, which usually has a bigger LD block. Okay, so I, I really wanna get this, the concept of linkage disequilibrium across. So we're gonna use, look at an example of GWAS looking to identify genes that can control berry number. So in our example, each row represents individual plant that is part of the GWAS study. So there's a functional causal SNP here that control the number of berry, but it's not genotype. So if you have T here, you're, you will have a berry, uh, you have plants with a uh, large number of berries, whereas if you have A here, you have plants with lower number of berry. And on the right-hand side, you have a genotype SNP that's in high LD, uh, with the causal SNP. Uh, this can be because they're physically very close to one, one another. So here you can see uh, if you have T here, you're very likely to have C in this genotype SNP, and that's just because they're in high linkage disequilibrium. And on the left-hand side, you have another genotype SNP where that is in low LD with the causal SNP. So this can be because they are very far apart from another. So here you really can see a pattern Right, so then you have T here, you can have G or A. If you have A here, you can have either G or A. So they're not linked uh, with one another. Uh, so here we can see that uh, this high LD SNP are in higher, oh, sorry, higher R square, which is a measurement for LD. Then this another SNP on the left hand side, which are in lower LD with our causal SNP. So if we perform association analysis in this scenario, even if we do not genotype, even if we don't have, do not have the genotyping information for this functional SNP, the high LD SNP still will show a significant association with the mean berry number, whereas the low LD SNP will not have a significant association with our trait of interest. And therefore, again, good marker coverage is very key to conduct a good genome-wide association study. So here, uh, we're just gonna go over a brief comparison uh, between linkage mapping and association mapping, right? So in linkage mapping, uh, usually you have a relatively smaller population size. And in terms of genetic marker, uh, it can usually be a lower density because uh, all you want to do is you want to observe this co-segregation. And once you detect the QTL, you can then go to fine mapping uh, to further narrow down the genetic region of interest. Uh, but the disadvantage of linkage mapping is that it has low allelic uh, diversity. Usually linkage mapping, you started with two parents. Uh, so you can either have allele one or allele two, and that's it. And then material generation, again, takes time. If you want to bring your generate, uh, if you want to do your mapping in F6, then it will take uh, a a time to generate these material. And it also has limited amount of recombination, meaning you have lower mapping resolution and you will get a bigger genetic region that is associated with your chain of interest. Um, and for association mapping or GWAS, uh, some of the pro is that you have high allelic diversity, right? Most of, most of the time you're using a diversity panel. So you're not just getting two alleles. Instead, you're looking at different alleles. And then you usually don't need to make any crosses. And you can take advantage of some of these historical recombination I've just talked about, which will allow you uh, uh, to look at a narrower genetic region that is associated with your trait of interest. 
Um, and some of the uh, disadvantages sometimes uh, GWAS you need to look at a higher number of population size to detect the uh, these market trade association and this is especially true when you have alleles uh, that are causal or that has an effect on your phenotype but they are presented in very low frequency and more often than not for GWAS you need to uh, optimize a number of genetic markers so you usually need to have higher density of genetic marker and following up on GWAS, you will always need uh, further future validation to demonstrate that this genetic region is in fact associated with your trade of interest. All right. So before we we get into, uh, so there are a few things that you need to consider uh, before you perform GWAS, right? The first thing you need to think about is your germ plasm. Now you need to really care, you need to carefully think about the genetic, uh, aspects and the available community resource that are in your germ plasm. So what is your diversity panel uh, going to be looking like? Is this going to be a land race of wheat from different parts of Tunisia, or is this going to be a diversity panel from around the world? And also, does this show phenotypic diversity, right? So the, does, does the panel demonstrate diversity in terms of the phenotype for your trade of interest? Because for GWAS to work, you need, you need a certain level of variation for your trade of interest. If they're the same, uh, then your GWAS is likely not going to work, right? So is there a good genetic diversity? Uh, and also, are there available genetic resources? Has these, these lines be genotyped already? For example, nowadays, because uh, of the reduction in genotyping costs, there have been many resequencing projects in weeds that aim to genotype many diverse lines. Uh, so it might be more cost-effective to assemble your panel based on um, based on whether or not they already have available genotyping information because it can potentially save you a lot of money uh, before you run your study. So for, for wheat, uh, CerealsDB would be a good website to look at. Uh, so it has a collection of genotype, genotyping data from different wheats uh, from, from around the world. So it might be worthwhile to see whether or not uh, your line of interest has already been genotyped already. Uh, it can potentially save you some money. Right. So also you want to think about your phenotype a little bit, right? Uh, phenotyping a little bit. How much replication would you really need to accurately assess your phenotype? What is the heritability of your trade looking like? How much of the how much influence does environment have on your trade of interest? So as I've mentioned early on, I work on abiotic stress tolerance, uh, which sometimes can have very low heritability because of the complexity of these traits. For example, for winter survival weeds, there are many stress factors that can lead to winter kill, uh, including the most obvious, the freezing, toler uh, freezing temperature, uh, ice encasement, or even lack of moisture over winter can all contribute to winter kill. This means that the winter stress is different in each winter. So for example, in this study, uh, in this case, we would then pick up different QTL depending on which season it is. For example, in this QTO, uh, sorry, this market trade association is picked up across multiple environments, suggesting that this potentially might be more useful uh, to confer uh, winter survival uh, in Canada, whereas we have QTO such as this, uh, sorry, market trade association such as this one, which only appear in one environment and might be due to a very specific stress factor that only happen in that year. So it is very important to think about your strategy for phenotyping before you go into it. How, how much replication do you need? Uh, what type of environments do you need to test your materials in in order to, to get a better um, readout from your genome-wide association study? So another uh, consideration is genotyping. So if unfortunately there is no available SNP data for your population, so then you might think of ways to genotype your population. So usually for GWAS, we need uh, more genotyping data per sample. And we rely on the identification of single nucle nucleotide polymorphism, since uh, these are some of the most common polymorphism across the genome. And nowadays genotyping is becoming cheaper and cheaper. So it is more affordable to be doing some of these methods on the right-hand side. So I'm going to use some of the wheat example. So for example, in wheat, there are axion wheat SNP array. So these are used to detect polymorphism within a population based on hybridization to a complementary sequence. Uh, and then you will later get the signal. Uh, so for example, if you cluster here, 
you have the allele, uh, you have the uh, you have allele one, whereas you cluster here of your allele two. Um, so these can be a good way uh, to to genotype your population. We can also do genotype by sequencing. In this case, the DNA is, DNA are extracted and digested with digested with a specific restriction enzyme, and these uh, fragments are then sequenced and aligned to a reference genome to be able to identify a uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. So another approach is some people that are using nowadays are whole genome resequencing, uh, where you sequence at a lower coverage. You're not sequencing it to be able to assemble a genome. You're sequencing at lower coverage, maybe uh, from 0 0.5 to 2, 2 coverage, and align these reads against the reference genome to be able to call your SNPs. So there, there, there are many different methods in which you can genotype your material. And it depends, and also depends on whether or not your crop that you're working with or the species that you're working with has a reference genome. But again, with the cost of genotyping going down, these type of work is becoming more and more affordable, regardless of what type of species that you're working on. And again, I just want to highlight this website, SeriousDB, which was developed by Bristol University in the UK. It has a lot of Axiom SNP chip data, as highlighted here, for different wheat accessions. So this is a good place to start with if you want to look to conduct genome-wide association study in wheat. And I'm, I'm sure in maize, there are also a similar collection uh, uh, as this, uh, but I personally uh, don't know the website, but maybe people can leave in the chats uh, whether for their organism, they have a similar uh, tool as well. So then other people can uh, uh, can use it. Uh, essentially, you know, websites like this will will make sure we don't end up genotyping the same line multiple times, right? Let's not let's not spend extra money when we can just make use of a public publicly available resource. Okay. <clears throat> So for the next part of the talk, I will briefly go over some of the underlying statistical idea behind GWAS. Um, I think it is very, very important to have a general understanding of the statistical model uh, because it will help you understand the strength, but also more importantly, it will help you understand the weakness and limitation of GWAS as well. So at the very beginning of GWAS, you can think of it, um, more or less as a t-test, right? So you want to test whether the accession uh, that have A here will be taller than the accession that have G here. And in this case, AA is shorter than GG. So this will be a significant marker trait association. So essentially, it's a t-test. So now when we perform, uh, but, but there are a lot of problems uh, that are associated, associated with t-test when you're performing it in a large number. We're running into this multiple testing problem. Uh, so when we're performing t-tests, we usually have what we call a statistically significant p-value, which more or less is the likelihood of getting a result that's as extreme as one that you observe, given that there's no true difference between the variable that you're looking at. So that's that. That's a, you're, you set your threshold p-value at 0 0.05. But if you have 90k SNP marker, 90,000 SNP markers, and you you're performing t-tests on all of them, just by chance alone, 4,500 of these markers will be associated with your trait just by chance, right? So you're getting a lot of false positives. So they're, they're, so false positives can potentially accumulate across large number of markers. So this is, this is one, this, this can be a limitation. And also uh, the naive model t-test does not address the genetic background of the population. And these genetic background can sometimes lead to uh, false positive as well. And I'll illustrate it, an example of how it does that. <clears throat> so here, uh, when we talk about population structure, I'm referring to the presence of subpopulation within a larger population that are genetically distinct from one another. So this can be caused by factors such as uh, geographic isolation, migration, or more. And population structure is, is important because it affects uh, the distribution of genetic variation. It also affects the allele frequency and can lead to spurious association with trait. So I, I, I saw some people saying that they work on barley. So today I'll use an example of two row and six row type barley. So both type uh, 
have alternating sets of three spikelets, right? However, in two-row barley, only the central spikelet are fertile and develop into seeds. So, so we'll create these more flat shape, shape head, whereas in six-row type, you have a round, rounded head appearance with all the six kernel developing. Um, so for this example, let's say we want to use genome-wide association study to find the underlying gene for this trait. So we decided to collect some two-row accession uh, from North Africa and also some six-row accession in North America. Right. So now we see the causal SNP uh, being aligned with our phenotype perfectly. Right. So if you have A here, you're going to have you're going to have the type, uh, uh, six row type, whereas you have G here, you're going to have a two row barley. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, uh, so historically, so this is an example, this is not, not actually real, but unfortunately, historically, there's been a leaf disease for barley in North America. So naturally, most of the session of barley have resistance to this leaf disease because they need to be able to survive. And so they carry the resistance allele and these are the causal SNP, right? So these are resistance. So most of them have resistance and the, one of the accession in North America has resistance and these are the causal SNPs. So if I perform GWAS in this case, right? I will likely also identify an association at genetic region that control disease resistance. And that is just because in this subpopulation of six row barley, there's a higher frequency for an allele that confer disease resistance as well, right? So, so you can begin to see how this um, difference in allele frequency can lead to false positive. Therefore, this is really important to control for population structure when you're running a genome-wide association study. So, um, so I'm going to give you an example, you know, uh, so this is an example of GWAS I performed in the past where it did not account for population structure. So you can see many significant association, uh, but however, these are all false positive as a result of population structure. So this can, this can, this, this can really uh, uh, affect whether or not you will find the true association uh, with your trade of interest. So you really need to watch out for these. Right. Or else you'll be like me at that time, which which was very unhappy. <clears throat> okay, so moving on, there's another uh, level, uh, and there's another degree of relatedness between individual within population, and these are called kin kinship. So these are based on the genetic similarity between individual, and these can be uh, measured using uh, SNP markers. So kinship is important in genetic analysis as well, because again, it can affect the statistical power of genetic association study and influence interpretational results. Um, for example, kinship can lead to false positive results in association study if, uh, if individuals are more likely to share both genetic variants and traits simply due to their relatedness, not because it's causal. <clears throat> so, the other model, so so so, since, so from the so the next model after the, the t-test model is that we have a mixed linear model which can help reduce the confounding effects of this relatedness between different individuals. Uh, so it essentially, is a unified mixed model framework that account for multiple level of relatedness. It can control for population structure based on estimation by the SNP data. Uh, so these can be done using uh, structure or using principal component analysis. And these, so you have, you have an estimation of the uh, effects of population structure. Uh, we also call these ma matrix the Q matrix. And there's also account for unequal familial relationship using the kin kinship matrix. And this can also be estimated using your SNP data set as well. And we call this the K. So sometimes you'll be, Sometimes you'll see this being referred to as the K matrix. And essentially, uh, these models, this model is asking if we account for population structure, uh, which is Q, and we account for kinship, does the SNP marker still have a significant effect on your phenotype, right? So this is essentially what the mixed model uh, uh, is looking at. So um, with the mixed model, it, it's actually, in fact, quite effective in controlling uh, for population, uh, for, 
for, for reducing false positive. And today we're gonna see that in our, our, our test example of how uh, a mi mixed model uh, can, can control for false positive. So under the expectation that random SNPs are unlinked to the polymorphism controlling these traits. So, so our no hypothesis is that there's no SNP effects, right? So most of your p-value is, is supposed to be a short uniform distribution that are supposed to be closer to this line. So you can see in this case, the simple model uh, right here, it has an inflated p-value showing that there's a lot of showing the potential of having a lot of false positive. Whereas if you account for population structure and kinship, you don't have that inflation of p-value and therefore you're less likely to get false positive in your results. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so they look at different traits, but again, you're seeing uh, a very, very, very similar thing. In, in examples where the, uh, the population has a high pop population structure, if you don't account for them, uh, you're gonna have a big inflation of your p-value, whereas Q and K can help account for that. Okay. So after mixed linear model, uh, there have been many, many improvements, right? Um, and mostly these improvements uh, increase computational efficiency and also increase statistical power as well. So I won't go into too deep on um, how these model will work, but essentially it is worthwhile to take a look at how they work if you decide uh, to use uh, these, these model, right? So you're gonna see farm CPU, you're gonna see CM, CMLM, and these, these model, in fact, you can all, all run in GAPIT, and that's what we're using GAPIT today. Um, but there's also, alternative framework for GWAS as well. And again, it would be, be a good idea to read more into it if you're interested in using some of these models. Um, so GWAS, uh, like I mentioned before, there are many challenges. Uh, so one of them is uh, dealing with low cell with minor allele frequency. Um, so some of these uh, uh, generic low cell that affect your trail of interest uh, happen in, you have an alternative allele that happen in a very low frequency, uh, but when they happen in a very low frequency, you're gonna it's gonna be difficult to pick it up because your the model will have lower confidence. Um, so likely, if you have low number of lines, uh, this phenotype can just occur by chance, uh, just uh, to be associated with your trait of interest. So and and this is unfortunate because sometimes large effect allele is in fact in low frequency within the population, and. Uh, like I was mentioning, GWAS will always require validation. So you find an association, but how do you verify it? Uh, so this potentially you can do is transgenic, you can do CRISPR-Cas9, you can do further genetic study in order to validate your result for GWAS. And there is also the problem of synthetic association where the causal gene sometimes is located far away from the GWAS peak. So your peak, so, so it's important to remember this point. Um, the peak, the, the SNP that has the most strongest association of your trait of interest is not guaranteed to be causal, okay? You need to keep this idea in mind. And this, uh, this can be because of um, many different reasons, right? So uh, some of the hypothesis is a rare allele hypothesis where the rare and large effect causal variant is linked to a common marker. And also, because you're using a diversity panel, tree variation can be caused by multiple different alleles within one gene, right? Since mutation are constantly generating new variants, so you can have multiple independent allele within one gene leading to the same phenotype. Um, so I'm going to use one of uh, the Sorgan SH1 as an example. Uh, so there are two causal holomorphism. Uh, so either you have the 2.2 kilobase deletion, then you're going to have non-shattering phenotype. Or if you have this mutation that affects splicing sites, you're also going to have the non-shattering phenotype. So you can see these lines all uh, have, to, when you phenotype them, they, they all um, have the non-shattering phenotype. But then they, these markers are not, these causal polymorphisms are not significantly associated uh, with the trait because you, you have different alleles that 
that can contribute to this phenotype. So th this then can then interfere with your signal. And in fact, they're picking up another SNP uh, that is at this location that's not causal, right? This A to G conversion. And because by chance, uh, most of the accession that have G just also are linked with other polymorphisms that are linking to your non-shattering phenotype. So again, the SNP, this SNP is not causal. It just occurred by chance just because of how it's linked to, to, to the phenotype. Um, so it's very important to, to remember, sometimes the causal gene can be located away from the GWAS peak. <clears throat> okay. So well, I'll talk about some of the tips on getting your uh, marker data right for genome-wide association study. Uh, right. So I usually like to, so, be, so if you see, you read some of these GWAS paper, they usually like to filter their SNP uh, prior to conducting GWAS. So I usually use, uh, so these are some of the uh, stuff that I filter out for. And then, you know, it, it can depend on the population that you're working with. I usually filter out markers that have low minor allele frequency. Again, a low minor allele frequency can likely lead to identification of peaks that we're not very confident about. And I also like to remove markers that are in complete linkage. Uh, when markers are in complete linkage, they don't necessarily provide any new information. So you can just keep one of the two. And also uh, markers have high missing rate. Uh, uh, this can just be because the marker didn't work well with your population and also marker that have he high heterozygosity rates. And usually when you see a marker that have high heterozygosity rate in a population that are expected to be uh, fixed, uh, it, it can be due to genotyping error as well. So I usually will filter uh, the, these markers out. And I usually use software such as Plink, Plink or Tassel. Tassel is a more user friendly software where you can where uh, it can help filter uh, your genotyping data. And as I mentioned, controlling for population uh, structure uh, is very important. So you can calculate population uh, structure with software such as uh, structure, and you can also do principal component analysis, which is what we will do today uh, in order to explain. No, uh, in order to control for population structure. And for kinship as well, uh, you can, for if you're doing human study, right, I see a few people saying that they're working on human, you can potentially use those information or identity by descent to, uh, to account for this related, related relatedness information. Uh, but you can also estimate kinship uh, based on the genotyping file, based on a SNP genotyping file. And today, GAT, and GAPIT will also help you um, um, estimate um, identity, uh, kinship based on the Van Random method. So some of the software uh, that I personally use for GWAS, I've used Tassel. Tassel is very user-friendly. It doesn't require any coding knowledge and has a good uh, interface in which you can uh, play around with. Uh, GAPIT, uh, which is the software I will use today, is very versatile. And I really uh, like looking at the output. You can also test different statistical model when you're running GWAS study, when you're using GAPIT, as we will see today. And uh, I've also done Plink before. Sometimes when working on larger data set, Plink is quite good as it can accommodate uh, a bigger data set. But, but nowadays, there are more and more softwares uh, uh, that are coming out that can accommodate bigger data sets as well. Uh, so usually, uh, as a result of GWAS, you're going to get an association table, and you probably will see this table in um, in most of the publication. So here, the SNPs are usually the name of the polymorphism, the name of the marker, the chromosome position, uh, which chromosome they're on, which physical position they're at, and also the p-value. So how strong is this association? with the trade of interest. So usually uh, the lower value will mean that you have a, this marker has a stronger association with your trade of interest. And then you can also look at minor allele frequency as well. So these, these allele are, are quite frequent in our population, right? 30% of the lines have this allele. And uh, also you sometimes they will produce a uh, allele effect table as well, which will roughly tell you how, what's the effects of this 
uh, this allele, right? For example, this can increase your trade by one point, uh, sorry, 0 0.128 uh, meter for your height, for example. So uh, so essentially these, these are some of the GWAS output that you'll see in different publications. Uh, but another plot that you, you probably have looked at many times are in, in paper are these Manhattan plot. And these plots are, are, are called Manhattan plot because uh, people see that they resemble the skyline of Manhattan, right? You see different buildings coming up. So that's why they're called Manhattan plot. But essentially a Manhattan plot is more or less just a scatter plot that's used to display a large number of data points and their significance in GWAS. So each data point is a SNP marker and the x-axis is your genomic position, right? There's the SNP marker is a position, uh, uh, chromosome one at the beginning of the chromosome and your y-axis is how significant it is with um, uh, associated with your trade of interest. So it's the negative log of the associated p-value. So the higher the value, the stronger the association. Another plot that you might see quite often is a uh, QQ plot. And I personally think QQ plot is very essential uh, for detecting problem in GWAS. And essentially a QQ plot ranked the p-value from the largest to the smallest. And it, it checks the distribution of the p-value against a null hypothesis. So again, under null hypothesis, none of the markers should be associated with our trade of interest. So uh, it should be, your QQ plot should be very close uh, to the line, except for the last few points that, uh, that have a significant association. So you want it to be closer to, to this red line. So the deviation from red line can sometimes suggest an inflation of the p-value. And again, this can be due to population structure that was not accounted by your model. And we will we will be we will see it today when we when we run two different models in our analysis. Okay. And also a lot of papers, they, they also talk about how they determine their p-value, right? So how do you decide a cutoff and how how did the paper decide what their cutoff p-value is going to be? And is, it, is this really a valid thing to do? So again, we, we have this multiple testing problem when we test a lot of SNP markers or an association, we were, were more likely to get um, a false positive. Um, so there are different ways that you might see in a paper that control for multiple testing. So some of them, so one of the more stringent way is called the bomb von correction. So you have your desired alpha value. So in this case, people usually set their p-value at 0 0.05 and you divide it by the number of markers, right? Uh, so if you have 10,000 marker, your, oh, sorry, 100,000 marker, then you will, the, your p-value threshold will be very small. So as you can see, this can, uh, this, this threshold is quite stringent and can often run into problem where you reject, uh, where you think a peak is not significant when in fact it actually is. Uh, so there's also other approach, which uh, is called false discovery rate. Uh, use the expected number of false positive to control for type one error. Um, so sometimes you'll see uh, a BH P value. So, so these p-values are p-values when they're accounted, uh, when, when they're calculated this way. So what, uh, so how do you, what do you usually do after uh, you run a genome-wide association study? Uh, I think many different groups have their own strategy, right? So typically I like to look at the local LD pattern after identifying an, associ an association. Let's say I have an association right here. You can see, you can then test within your population how big of a genomic region is passed down together along with your marker, right? So in this case, uh, two, in, in this case, for this, this significant marker, usually the neighboring section of 229 kilobase pair are usually passed down together. Uh, so, your candidate genes are likely to be within this region because most of the uh, most of the uh, because in your population uh, most of them most of the variants are set are, are passed down together within within this little block. So you can you can then so your candidate genes will likely be to be within your the to this block or or sometimes we refer to it as the LD block. And uh, you can also 
you know, filter out some of these candidate gene using some other approach. So now I have, you know, I've talked about some of the approach in wheat. You can look at the expression pattern of these genes. Uh, do these genes have expression pattern that might suggest it has a function in affecting height? You can also look at some of the function in the ortholog orthologous gene. So you can look for orthologous gene or orthologs in, um, in ensemble plants. This can also help you understand the potential function of these genes in, in the region. And then later on, you can then test it with transgenic or tilling uh, in order to really understand the function of these genes. So in addition to using a genome-wide association study, uh, you nowadays more and more studies are, look, are looking to use a nested, nested association mapping population. Uh, so essentially, this kind of population combine the advantage of both linkage mapping, again, the QT analysis, and association mapping, which is the GWAS that we've been talking about. Um, so here, instead of just having two parents, you have uh, multiple founder parents that are crossed to a common founders, and they are progressed to be a single seed descent to a later generation. So these, because uh, we just have a, we have more founders, uh, but this can increase the frequency of a rare allele. So they don't just present in one or two lines. They're going to present in uh, more lines that are in your, line, uh, in your population. And you're still going to get that rich allele, allele diversity because you're using multiple founder parents as well. And again, uh, you can potentially get a higher mapping re uh, resolution in comparison to linkage mapping. Uh, because you, you you can still take advantage of some of these historic recombination that happened between the founders and then lower market, which will give you lower market density requirement. Uh, but some of this advantage is that it, it can still take time and can be expensive to develop. But a lot of these recent publication have shown that um, they have already developed a NAM, uh, NAM population. So why not take advantage of these resources that are already available? So for the practical session, uh, we today will use will conduct GWAS using a walk-in diversity panel. So these are wheat land race from different parts of the world. So we have some line, uh, most of them are from Europe. We have some line from North, North Africa as well. Um, so it'll be interesting to look at them. And again, I want to give credit to Dr. Luzi Wingen, who has generously provided this data set to us. So it should be in the file that you were asked to download yesterday, but we'll take a look at them together. Uh, so essentially these lines, are, uh, there are 828 wheat recessions and they are genotyped by the Axion 35K SNP chip. And they're in the HapMap format, uh, which is what you can see here. We'll talk a little bit about the formatting later on, but essentially this format is one of the format that GAPIT can read it in. So you're going to have first 11 column, right? So you're going to have your name of your uh, axion uh, SNP, your allele, C or T, chromosome, position, strand. And you're also going to have these other informations, but these are not important for GAPIT because GAPIT essentially just look at uh, the first few of these columns, uh, the position, the chromosome, uh, alleles, and, and so forth. And usually the allylic effect is estimated with respect to the nucleotide that is second in alphabetical order. Uh, so for example, if you have SNP that is, let's see, A or G, and then the, then the positive allylic effect will indicate that G is a favorable allele. Uh, okay, so there are other formats as well, but you can use the TASO software to convert between the formats. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank uh, you uh, for listening to a theoretical session. And uh, I want to thank Zihao Zhang, uh, who has done a similar online workshop. And, and in fact, I've taken a lot of inspiration from his presentation. Again, and also thank all my colleague, Lucy Wingen, Dr. Lucy Wingen, for providing the data sets. And before we get into a practical session, I would like to take a few questions uh, before we move on. Uh, so maybe Amal can let me know if we have any questions from the audience yes thank you andy so we have first question from lola she's asking in an experiment with forest species how many is the optimal number of individuals to carry out she was analysis using whole genome sequencing uh sorry which which species i, I missed that part of the question forest species 
forest species. Oh wow, I have uh, that's difficult to say. I I don't really understand the genomic structure of forest tree per se. So it really it really depend on uh, whether or not you're expecting a lot of recombination and how big the linkage block is usually in this species. So uh, in general, you if you have uh, I, I would say if you have a lot of recombination, then maybe 200 would be good. And if and for a forest species, you already have a reference genome, you can do the resequencing approach that I've just talked about. And then uh, resequencing approach, which, which just sequence the genome in a very low density and then again align against your reference genome. So that so 200 should be quite reasonable depending on the size of the forest trees. So in weeds, for example, we have quite a big genome, but for skin sequencing nowadays, uh, we can usually do it, uh, yeah, usually maybe maybe around 100 per sample, so it's still not cheap, um, but it, 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 will, it will only become more and more affordable if we're just doing Illumina short reads. Okay. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, how heritable is uh, the winter surviving threads? Are the offspring of hardy wheat plants always also hardy. Oh, right. So that, that's a good question. So in uh, really depending on how you how you test for winter survival in Canada. So if you only test for winter survival in one location, you 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 think that the trait is very heritable. But if you test winter winter hardiness in different environment across Canada, you'll realize the trait is not very heritable. And again, that, that goes back to the complexity of trait. There's different stress factor that can affect your winter survival each year. And therefore, uh, usually when you're measuring uh, heritability for winter survival is not that high uh, 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 across different environment. But usually, uh, I would still say tolerance to freezing temperature is a major determinant for winter survival in Canada. So usually if you have winter, winter hardy winter wheat line that has good tolerance to freezing temperature, usually that would perform quite well across different environment. But again, we still have to see what kind of winter stress is, is, uh, is in that environment that you're testing in. And I, I did see some, some, our co some colleagues that are from Canada that are doing these studies. So you see that, you know, in fact, winter survival across different provinces are very are very different. Uh, where certain provinces might have, where, might, where certain provinces, disease resistance is also a factor, right? Snow mold can also affect the winter survival of winter weeds in some region of Canada as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There is another question about models. So what uh, what is assumption for different uh, model, GLM, MLM, C, ML, etc. Uh, so the assumption is that there's no uh, marker that is associated with our trail instrument. So that's that's the no no hypothesis uh, that we're testing uh, against. I, I I hope I answered that question okay. I think I think that's what the question is about. But if not, you you can send me an email when when we can discuss it further. Okay. So there is a question about polyploid crops. So. Mm. Uh, is it tough to do GWAS uh, for po polyploid crops like potato as compared to diploid crops? Definitely, definitely. There, there's going to be there's going to be difficulties, in, especially in the genotyping part, right? Uh, so wheat is, is also polyploid, and sometimes when before we had reference genome, we had a trouble assigning our markers to the different homologs. We don't know whether this marker is in chromosome one A, one B, or one D. Right, um, but hopefully with reference genome, uh, you can more accurately assign uh, the, a physical location to your marker. But yeah, essentially working with polypoid crop, there is challenges uh, in terms of genotyping for sure. Okay, we have a question about human microbiome. So if you have any idea which database can be used for GWAS analysis? A hu human microbiome. Um, hmm, sorry, I, I to be honest, I don't. But maybe someone in the chat also work with uh, human microbiome GWAS. Um, so, so maybe someone else in the chat can answer. But I personally don't have experience with that. Sorry. Okay, we have another question also. 
With uh, 5PC, we were used as population structure in Watkins. What if we use population structure with five groups? Would it, would it get similar results? Uh, right, so instead of using the value you get from PC analysis, you just want to assign five groups to it. Uh, that's a good that's a good question. I, To be honest, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's worth testing it out and see whether or not um, you will see uh, whether or not it will affect uh, your GWAS results. So, so, so it's definitely worth looking at, but I, I don't have the answer for that question. Okay, we have another question about uh, data set format. So how to convert uh, double row SMP data to HubMap from which format, which can uh, be used for debit? Uh, so which format was was this question from? So I missed that part. Double H. Uh, double row SNP. How to convert uh, double row SNP to uh, half map format? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a really good question. I have have not never used a, uh, used that uh, genotyping format before. Uh, but I think if you if you do a Google search, you might be able to find answer to it. And Tasso is also quite good at being able to import different genotyping format. And what you can do is you can import these files into Tassel and then save them as half map. So Tassel can be a good uh, intermediate step, uh, intermediate software for you to convert these genotyping file. But I, I also think you can potentially Google these, so uh, uh, Google and, and, and find out uh, what, what would be the best way to convert them. But personally, I have not used that format in the past. Okay, another question. Do we need to run SNPs for all of those uh, genotypes for which phenotype, phenotyping has been, sorry, has been done? What if we have less number of genotypes with SNPs data as compared to phenotypic data? Uh, so usually, you, uh, in order for the phenotype to be accounted, you need genotypic information for these lines. And I, I understand sometimes it can be difficult to... Um, to genotype the population just because of the cost uh, of it. So I've seen people that have used a more dense, uh, have done uh, more dense genotyping for a subset of the population, and then and then use a more lower coverage method later on, and then use imputation as a way uh, to then complete the genotyping information. So that can be a way uh, where you don't have to have a full genotyping information for the full panel and where you can take advantage of imputation in order to infer the genotype in some, some of your uh, lines that you're working with. Okay, you still have some questions. When a single SMP is suppressing the threshold and not, and not building uh, SNP, does the single SMP still significant after Bonforni correction? Uh, so just single SMP being significant. Um, that that's interesting. Uh, so usually when when we see a significant peak, we are expecting to see something like a tower, right? So I've talked about Manhattan plot, something like a structure, and that's because there are markers that are nearby, close to it, that are in weak linkage with this marker of interest. So in this case, you should still see a certain level of significance to uh, to 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 this marker that are showing high association. So if you, you're just seeing a single marker uh, coming up, uh, usually uh, that, that means there it's a, a sporadic association uh, or there might be something wrong with the genotyping information. Um, but, but regardless, it, it's important to take a closer look uh, at, at, at this SNP later on as well. Okay, another question. If you have a pedigree data of some genotypes, can mm. we integrate that into kinship matrix? And can we do that using R or any other software which can convert the whole pedigree into parents and then use it to tune up the kinship matrix? Yeah, I, I, I think there, there, there are ways to do it. I, I personally have not used kinship, uh, uh, sorry, so pedigree data before, and that's just because uh, usually when I'm using working with these diversity panel, we don't have those kind of data, but there are definitely ways to com convert uh, these pedigree data into relatedness value that can be uh, used as a random model in your mixed linear model. Uh, okay, another questions. In which models are more accurate for uh, gen genomic uh, selection and durometer for FHB resistance? Ooh. 
uh, genomic selection for winter. Uh, winter. Uh, I I don't have the answer to this question. Uh, again, the, uh, this workshop we're looking mostly at GWAS, uh, but but you but I, I think what this person is alluding to is whether or not we can use some of these GWAS results for genomic selection. And in fact, we can. Some some of these gaps will also uh, uh, output. Uh, uh, the genomic estimated breeding value uh, for these marker as well. Um, but this will, I, I personally don't have any experience with this, so I don't, I don't think I can comment on it with confidence. Okay, thank you. We have another question about overall objective of uh, GWA. So once done, how can the, result, the results be used to improve our uh, rate of returns for, for example, for yield or nutrient, uh, et cetera? Right, right. So that, that's that's a good question. So when you're running GWAS, you will end up with a genetic loci with a peak marker that's associated with your trait. And you can look at uh, which line has the positive allele for your trait of interest. Let's say you want higher iron content, for example. And you can see some of these markers are associated with higher iron contents and can potentially be used as parents for you to introduce introduce this higher higher nutrient quality into your germplasm of interest and 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 the GWAS result can be used as uh, that that peak marker can be developed into markers that can help you with the back crossing to integrate this trait of interest and with like what I've alluded to earlier on some people some people have also used GWAS as a way to understand the genetic basis of this of this trait like what gene is affecting um what gene is affecting height, which allele is affecting heights. And by better understanding these genes and these better allele, people, people can then use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to target these genes to generate uh, different alleles that you can find in nature. So there, there, there are different ways in which you can, you can, you can, uh, you can use GWAS result. But, but in a breeder's perspective, um, we usually, I, I think most of the breeders use it as as a way to identify markers that can help integrate some of these traits that they need in the breeding program. Okay, we have another question about uh, data format. So how can we convert SNP data in Excel to HapMap format? So maybe TASL, yes? Yeah, TASL would be good, yeah. Okay, so another question is, uh, could you interval mapping comparable with GWAS? have more than three founders? Yeah, uh, yeah, have more than three founders. So maybe they're referring to the nested association mapping population I'm talking about, Def that definitely. Uh, you, pro uh, I'm not, never really processed a uh, result from them before. So you probably, probably will require different, different software for it. But again, I, like I was alluding to earlier, there, there have been more and more study that are using uh, these nested associated mapping population for their uh, for dissection of these uh, the genetic basis of the tray again because NAM has the advantage of uh, you know increasing allele frequency for some of these rare alleles uh, it also can take advantage of these historic co recombination so so there are definitely advantage in using some of these NAM population but we won't touch on it uh, for 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 our practical session today. Sorry, I'm on your, your mute, so I can I, I can hear your question. Ah, okay. So another question about uh, Manhattan plot. If uh, just a second, if Benformi and FDR uh, don't give significant value, which value we can adopt? Oh yeah. No, that that that's a good question. I mean, sometimes you you just don't see an association with your trade of interest. And at the end of the day, if you don't see an association, that's, that can be due to many different factors. Uh, but I think um, if you don't see an association, it's, uh, it's, it's not really the way that you're evaluating p-value. Uh, like for example, yeah, like I mentioned that bonferroni can potentially be too stringent, uh, but there are other other methods such as the FDR that are a little more lenient. Um, so you can potentially uh, look to see whether or not that change your output. And if you if you don't, you 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 and then you end up wanting to focus on some of these other QTO, uh, so some of these market trade association that has lower 
uh, lower p-value that does not reach your threshold, that's also possible as well. But you just need to go in with an understanding that there's a greater risk uh, for your uh, for your introgression of trade when you're using these uh, regions that are not as strongly associated with your trades. And then, yeah, so you just need to understand there, there's there's higher risk involved in 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 this in this way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And we have a question about uh, validation methods. So mm -hmm. the question is, we need to validate the GWAS results by developing CASP markers and RT-PCR. What are the other methods of validation? Right. Uh, so th there are many ways to validate it. You can potentially knock out the gene. Uh, so for example, in wheat, we have these tilling population that can potentially uh, carry, uh, carry mutation that can knock on the gene. So we can then look at these population that have this mutation and see whether or not it does affect our trade of interest. If it does, then this is an indication that you know you, you did pick up a true, uh, true association and this gene is potentially the causal gene uh, for, for controlling your trade of interest. Um, other validation method, we have also used methods such as using uh, a near isogenic line. So two lines that are genetically very similar, except for that loci. And then this can allow us to really evaluate whether or not this loci has that effect uh, as what was found in GWAS. So these are two of the more genetic focus method. And of course, nowadays with uh, transgenic, with uh, gene editing, there are other approaches uh, you can you, you can eventually apply these two approach, but these two approaches are a little harder to adopt because they do require certain level of expertise in transformation and in gene editing. Yeah. Hey, we have another question about if our GWAS analysis is successful or not. So the question is if we are unable to find a single gene responsible for our particular threat after doing GWAS, then will it be a failed experiment? Well, uh, I don't know. I, I I don't know the answer to this question. Will Will it be a failure of an experiment? I, I whether or not you find an association or not, I think it 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 can give you an insight into a uh, region that associated with your trait of interest. I wouldn't call it a failure. It's just maybe a genome association study is not the best method to dissect your trait. In this case, then I, again, I would look at maybe, maybe looking at QTO mapping where you have two parents that are very different for your trait of interest, or you can then uh, look at alternative such as using the NAM population that I was referring to. So I don't think, I wouldn't call it a failure. It's just maybe genome association study is not the best method for the trait or for the population that you're working on, and it, it and you should be looking at other, other, and it 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 is successful in in a case that it is telling you that maybe you should start looking for other alternative method that you can work with. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Another question for Watkins: Is it still better to use locus model like MLM with a very low statistical power, or multi lux options should yeah. be preferred? Yeah, so I so today we will only talk about mixed linear model, but like we're saying, some of these newer model, uh, they they do in fact increase statistical power, so it will be better to use them. Um, but like what I've recommended before, uh, I think it's important to really understand what these multi locus model are doing before you're performing them. But today we'll just go through the single locus model because it is intuitively easier to understand, and that's why I'm using it as an example for our session today. Thank you, Andy, and for the, this insightful question. So I think we need to move to practical session and maybe we have another session in the end of the workshop. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And if, if I don't get to address your question, you're more than welcome to uh, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to try to answer your questions. Uh, but but like all of you, you know, I'm also uh, someone that's trying to apply GWAS in my study. Uh, so I might not have the answer to all the questions, but I can uh, talk a little bit more about uh, some of my personal experience and what worked for me and what didn't. Okay, thank you. All right. So for the next part of the workshop, if you can see my screen, we're going to get into the practical side, right? Uh, it's great, we learned about the theory, but let's see if we can run it. <laughs> okay, so let me see if I can open the chat window. 
Let's see. So do everyone have a chance to download the file uh, from yesterday? Yeah, most, I think, I'm guessing yes. Yes, no, maybe, okay. Yes, okay, right. So the from, from the file of yesterday, you should get a example script, right? So these will be, this will show you uh, the, the code that we will need to run uh, our analysis today, which is right here. You should also get a practical working sheet, okay? So the practical working sheet should contain uh, some of the questions that I want you to answer based on uh, the analysis that we're going to be doing uh, uh, doing today. So these, these are these are good 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 practice exercise to fully test whether or not you understand the output from the GWAS. So and we you should have the data in the data folder. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick look. So for the phenotype data, you should have three. Oh, let me let me open it in Excel. Sorry. But essentially for the phenotype data, you should have three columns, right? A little slow today, that's why. Right. right, so you should have three columns. You should have taxa, which are your, the name of your lines, right? So these are different, different walk-in sessions. So in total, we have 825 in this phenotypic file. And we have two phenotypes that we're looking at today. We have the heading date, right? so the day it takes to head, and also the plant height data as well. So these are usually the format that we're looking at. So you just want to make sure when you're using these phenotype data, you want to make sure there's no space. You want to make sure uh, it's just uh, one, uh, one continuous, I guess, character so that uh, Gapper will read it in uh, successfully, okay? okay? And we'll also have the genotypic data, which is in hot map format, so I'll quickly show that to everyone. In a second. So it's a little slow today, but we'll, it's okay. <clears throat> I'm just going to give it a second. Okay. So this is a genotypic file, right? So again, these are the hap, hap map files. So again, you see the name of your marker, the alleles, the chromosome, and the, chromo uh, uh, the position. And in your column, it's your individual genotype, right? Genotype one, genotype two, and they have different genotype at each marker, right? So these, this, these are kind of the format of the HapMath file where your uh, marker data is your row and your, your individual data is your column, okay? Okay, so it looks good. We're not going to touch it right now, but this essentially is the file that we'll import for our practical session. All right. Okay, so let's get back to the R script. So essentially, the R script is relatively straightforward. First, we want to be able to install. Um, we want to be able to install Gapit, and usually, if you just type in these two lines, you should be able to install Gapit. And you also want to make sure that your R is the most up-to-date version, because sometimes I find that an earlier version of R, they do have uh, trouble compiling, sorry, trouble installing some of the packages. So we're just going to click Run. Andy, can you post these two lines in the chat, please? Yep, of course. I'll post Thank the two you. in the chat. Oh, sorry, I think I 
everyone a meeting. There you go. Okay. So I'm just gonna give everyone a second to to test out whether or not they can download Gapit uh, based on these two lines. Yeah. Can you also increase the fonts because it's really, really, uh, it's like small. Oh, small. Okay. Okay. Let me see. If I can make Thank it. you. Okay. I hope this is more visible for people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Another one. Well, okay. at least for me. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, but if you if you have trouble following along, don't worry because the code will still be there, so you can try it on your own time later on. Um, okay. So can I get a? Uh, uh, so maybe I'm gonna give people two minutes, two to three minutes, to make sure they can download Gapit. And if it works, if these two line work for you, can can I just get a yes in the chat just to make sure people have Gapit downloaded? Okay, I see. I see yes from Eddie Muhammad. Okay, yeah, good, good, Radican, yeah. Good, so I'm just gonna give people another minute to make sure people can download this software. Yes, good, good, I'm glad it works. Yeah, because uh, I've I've spoken to a lot of people uh, that have tried to run Gapit, and sometimes uh, people have trouble. One of the biggest problems is that they have trouble downloading Gapit. So I just want to make sure people people can get at least get to this step. Yep, you can also install. I uh, see people install Gap Gapit from GitHub link. Yeah, that can also work as well. There are different ways of installing it. Um, but based on my experience, these two lines is just just a lot easier to just type in. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm not seeing other messages. Maya is asking LME for package required. Okay. So in your second line, it should load. It should load that. It should load that package. Uh, but I think if you type in. Um, Yep. So, so that's a good question. We're using ATCG format. Uh, so you can also have 012. So you can potentially convert the 012 to ATCG yourself. Or I think Gapit is also able to read in the 012 format as well. But I would definitely recommend, I would definitely recommend uh, uh, reading the user manual, right? Uh, take a look at the user, uh, user manual. Uh, I've been using HapMap, but there, there's definitely other format where that, that, that can also work as well. So essentially we just want import. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're gonna get into the first step. So first of all, we wanna import the genotyping file, okay? So, let's see. So this, so the genotyping file is the HapMap format. So if you just wanna be able to find uh, the directory, so for me personally, my directory is here. And then you wanna make sure when you're importing your genotyping file, at the end, the head, it says head equal to false. So this is an important line that you need to have when you're importing hapmap file, okay? So essentially just read that table into another file called myg. That's just the way I name it. You can name it differently. You can name it genotype file. But yeah, just click run. Oh, no such file, okay. Uh, give me a second, good. So you always wanna make sure your directory is correct. So just let me double check, let me directory is correct. Um, let's see, users, Chenny, uh, desktop, Jewels, workshop. Our working group. Do uh, was underscore gap in underscore practical underscore AC. Yeah, that looks okay. Walk in axiom 35K. Walk ins axiom 35K. Genotype 
person.hfp.txt. Oh, that should be okay. I don't know why it's not reading it. <clears throat> mm. Try to should, should work. No such file. Uh, yeah. mm. Okay. Give me a second. Maybe it's the name of the file. Let me see. Yeah, it works in our console that each and P so that text that falls here should be okay. Let's try it again. Okay. Uh how's everyone importing the genotype files? Everyone doing okay? Running into a little bit of problem, but that's all right. It's all about problem solving. Mm. Problem. Oh, sorry. Mm. Should I put it in the desktop and see if this will help a little bit? Okay, so I think I typed something wrong in the directory, but now it's importing the file. Let's read the chat a little bit. Okay, so now you can see the genotype files in. Right, okay, so again, you have all the information in here, so that's great. Okay, good. And now we want to import the phenotype file. Let me type in the directory again. Um, okay. I change the directory to a different one just because it's easier. Oh. So walk in phenotype a use for tassel. Let's read it in. And in this case, I want to make sure your head is equal to true. Your heading is true in this case. Okay, so now we got both of our genotype and phenotype in here. Looks good. Looks good. Let me double check my genotype. Looks good. Okay. Uh, do people have, uh, is everyone on the same step? Have everyone successfully import the file? Making sure it's in. Okay. Oh, yes, they import it. Good, good. Okay. Now I'll explain a little bit about the GWAS code in this scenario. So here you just need to say my gap it. Oh, let me see. Yes, yes, yes. Gap it. So in here for your Y. Uh, so Y is the head false in the my G. So that's just the file requirement for uh, for the gap it to read in the hat map format. So if you you just want to uh, do the false. So in, in this case, when you, when you when you do the false, your first line is not included in the heading, but your first line is in, included in the second, in, in the first row instead. So you just want to make sure it says false there. Okay. Okay, so in terms of your my gap, mm -hmm. so today we're going to run it a little, little uh, this is how I usually run it. So for your Y is your phenotype. So against your phenotype file is my Y, G is my G, and PCA dot total again, because we want to use principal component 
to account for population structure. So here I'm saying we're using the first five principal components and GAPA will calculate the principal component for you. And uh, we want to do some filtering for our SNP. Uh, so we're filtering the SNP by minor allele frequency for 0 0.05. So anything that has lower than 0 0.05, any markers has a minor allele frequency lower than 0 0.05 will be filtered out. And today's analysis will also run a multiple analysis. So we make it true. And this is because we want to run different model. So we want to run a general linear model. Uh, and we also want to run another model called the mixed linear model, which will uh, use the population structure and the kinship as well. So if you want to just go ahead and run these lines, should, your gap should start running if we install properly. It's going to take a few minutes. So if you want to make sure it runs on your computer, just give it a go as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can paste the whole script there. Uh, there you go. This is the thing. And these are for importing the data. So if you didn't get the R file, these these are the these are the these are the script. Yes, I think so. Uh, so I got a question. Can we use Tassel to convert 0, 1, 2, 2, 80 GC? Yes, you can. Okay, it's running great. I'm glad. Uh, so one of the difficult part about running workshop like this is that sometimes it works on your computer, but it doesn't work on other people's computer. So I'm happy that it's working for you. Good, good. <clears throat> So we can slowly read through some of the output that GAPIT is giving us. How did you choose the number of PC? That's a very good question. Um, so sometimes uh, I pick it based, sometimes you can take a look at your PCA and then decide how much a variance accounts for. And then based on that, then you can decide how many principal component nodes a principal component you want to include. So sometimes maybe your first three principal component account for large amount of variance, then you can just decide you just use, use three instead of five. But in this case, I had a, I had a little look at the data. So we're going to use five for our, our, our study. Okay, right, so it's running. Uh, so as you can see in the first line here, it's already filtering out for our minor allele frequency SNP. So, about 9,430 markers have lower minor allele frequency than the threshold that we set. So it's been filtered out, but we were still able to keep around 25,000 uh, markers. Okay, so again, it's calculating kinship for us. Uh, okay, good, kinship calculated. It's calculating the principal component. Um, This script is okay for durum weeds. Uh, yes, it should be okay for durum weeds, but in terms of weeds, there's a problem because we have one A, one B, one D genome, but uh, for gap to run, you need to convert it into a numerical format. So, so what I do is one A, one B, one D just correspond to chromosome one, two, and three uh, because it only reads a number for the chromosome region. We took two models here. Yes, in this case, we're looking at two models today because I want to illustrate a few points uh, in the outputs, okay? Want to illustrate whether we want to illustrate the importance of using uh, to control to control for population structure. So that's why we're looking at two models. But uh, after this session, I would encourage all of you to look at the user manual, and you can see that they have different models that you can use, and it, it talks about the different advantages and different uh, the different restriction that each model has. So I would definitely recommend looking at these user manual after our session today. What is the sandwich burger and dressing? I don't see that on my code just yet, but it might come up. Mm -hmm. Right, so Olivia asked a, asked a very good question. How do you generate the HapMap file? So that, that's a very good question. Uh, so you usually get your GBS or whole genomic data and you run and get your SNP marker. So for that, you will then already have the chromosome position, 
the uh, the physical position marker and your SNP calls as well. So then you can then uh, convert it into the format that is um, uh, similar to a hat map format. So, so sometimes there are scripts online. So you, I think it would be worthwhile to look at some of these uh, scripts to see whether or not uh, there, there's already a script that you can use. But if not, some uh, maybe Tassel can also import uh, 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 import this format. So I've never used GBS or GBS format before, so I wouldn't know how, how it should work. But essentially, you have all the necessary data for you to run the analysis. So I got an error, stop error, error and plot window, and value y limit value. Uh, Okay, so you got an error there. That's interesting. I'm not sure why you get the error. Uh, done, it's working now. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why that error happened. The Y limitation error happened. So sometimes this happens. So if you, so Rishikesh, if you want to check the genotyping file and make, make sure that the chromosome position is in, in the numeric format, if it's not in the numeric format, that can be one of the reasons why you get that error. So I used to get that error quite a lot. Okay, so people can download GAPIT now. That's good. Okay, does GAPIT perform PC analysis? Uh, no, that's a that's a good quite uh, good question. Sometimes in the past, uh, GAPIT has this model model called uh, this function called model selection, in which you can com compare analysis from different uh, models. So in this case, you can look at uh, to include different number of PCA, um, but now they don't have it anymore. So you can you can test it out. But usually, I would say, uh, including five principal component is more than enough for your analysis. Okay. So here you can see that uh, it's generating uh, the uh, Manhattan plot. You can see candidate identified in different. Uh, chromosome here, but we'll look at the output later. Uh, so don't worry, you don't need to, uh, uh, to look too deep into that for now. Make sure you just play basically. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. You. Yeah. With Plink, you can convert VCF to hat math. Thank you, Demand. That's a that's a very good point. Yeah. Plink Plink is also quite useful in converting between these formats, so that's a that's a very good point. Uh, but just just to note that you do need to uh, code a little bit when you're working with Plink. Can you please explain the gap in syntax once again? Uh, due to header force, all went to character format. Is there any other package available for GWAS except for Gapit? Um, so personally, I use Gapit. You can also use Tasso, and you can use Plink as well. Uh, but for R, uh, I can't remember on the top of my head, there, there might be other uh, packages, so it's worth Googling it. Uh, uh, GWAS Poly, okay, maybe. I, I've never used that before. So the gap in index, uh, so syntax. So in terms of the syntax, again, just to go over it, the, the Y is your G, uh, phenotypic file, the G is your genotypic file, and PCA.total, just saying how much uh, principal component you want to include in your mixed model. And this is just the minor of Leo frequency that you want to filter your markers at. And for us, we're including these other stuff because we want to do different models. We want to do the GOM model. We want to do the mixed linear model as well. Okay. So strings. Mm -hmm. So we cash. That should work. String my Y. Uh, I'm not sure what Rishi Cash is trying to show me, um, but it should run. It, it it should run if you just use the file that are in the in the stuff. But but don't worry, don't worry if if it doesn't run at the moment. Uh, we probably won't have a chance to troubleshoot for everybody. But if it doesn't work uh, in that downloaded file that we have, you should also. You should also get uh, you should also get a results file. So result file, I have copied down all the result that you're gonna get from this analysis. So we can all, we, even if the G the gap doesn't run for you in R right now, we'll still go over this result file to make sure everybody can understand. Uh, okay. So warning is install this package. Okay, let's see how to compare the result of different statistical model. Right. Uh, that's a that's that's a good question. Uh, 
that's a good question, Vishnavi. It's uh, which model is better for data? Uh, I think it, it really is up to uh, you to decide which model is good for your data. I think it's worthwhile to look at how these models work. Uh, but from the general gist I'm getting from the user manual is that some of these user uh, a newer model have higher statistical power. So it's good to good to, but it, but it's, uh, it's good to think about why you use these models. So I, I would definitely recommend reading the paper from these models. But some of these new new models tend to have higher statistical power. Okay, have the same gap. Uh, okay, so uh, this can also this can also happen. Uh, because that your the version of your R is outdated, uh, so you might want to think about updating the version of your R. I think you can talk more about the syntax in the body of the code. Let me place naming conversion of your import data by saying, "Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, oh, okay." That's a good core. Uh, yeah. So in terms of syntax of code, you can you can use anything. You can you can call it genotype, you can call it phenotype. And then, but here you just need to convert to uh, change change uh, relative to this. So yeah, in, in essentially it's just how you name it. Uh, so it doesn't, it, it should be okay. So the file is still running, but we, I'm gonna use this chance to kind of look at, okay, maybe I'm gonna give people maybe one or two more minutes to make sure uh, to uh, give them a chance to get it to run. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll get into looking at some of the readouts because I think we're running a little low on time, but I really wanna make sure we can understand what the gap at output is, is, is telling us, right? Because I think that's the important part. <clears throat> So just two minutes before I move on uh, to the next part. So again, we, we see this another question on the PCA. So in, in this case, I uh, because of some of the previous knowledge, uh, I think having five principal components is very good at controlling for population structure. You can, of course, look at the amount, amount of variance that each principal component explain and then make that decision for yourself. Is there any option we get information about the time it's taking for running this comment? Eh, that's a good question. I don't think, uh, I don't know uh, if there's such an option, but maybe someone else would know from the chat. But essentially, it shouldn't take more than ten minutes to to uh, to to finish running the whole thing. Uh, I, I, but that, of course, depends on how much how much marker data you have. So today we have a lot of marking our data, so that's why it's taking a little longer. And we also have a lot of genotype as well. Um, but usually, it shouldn't take that long. Okay, so we're running a little low on time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to move on to the results folder uh, while. While the code is still running in the background, so in that folder that you download, there's a this results subfolder where I kind of already put in all the outputs, uh, in the the GWAS model, and I want to really look at some what some of these are saying to you. Okay, so we're gonna uh, let's see, uh, let's look at plan uh, heading dates for example. So GAPO will output this window which tells you the, uh, the phenotypic overview. So this is quite useful if you're looking at the phenotype the first time, but usually you should look at the phenotype before you run your GWAS. So I look at the distribution of your phenotype. Uh, so it's, it, you can see that uh, uh, some lines have less than 80 centimeters for high, some lines have about 127 for high. So this is a good way to visualize uh, how your phenotype is distributed. Okay, so this is a good, good one to look at. Let's see the next one. So for the next one, uh, um, let's look at, uh, so people were bring up PCA. Let's look at PCA. So this is kind of the, uh, the PCA plot for your phenotype. So you can see that 
potentially there's some subgroups here, right? So potentially, let's see if I can annotate the, the chart. Potentially there's subgroup, right? So this is potentially telling us that it is important to account for principal components in our analysis. So it's good that we include a PCA in our analysis, okay? And that, that, that's, that's what we're expecting because uh, these accessions are from different parts of, of the world. So, so it is potentially that can contribute to these different distribution. Okay, let's look at the next one. Sorry. Um, okay. So here we can see the Q, uh, the Manhattan plot already, right? So Olivia, so we're gonna go go over go over these out quick. Uh, so we can look at the Manhattan plot. So you can see we have Manhattan plot for both the GOM and the mixed linear model because we run two different models. So if you do the chromosome one, it will output each chromosome individually. Uh, but if you do the gen genome one, you can do you can look at the entire genome. So I just want to compare the GOM for heading date against the mixed linear model for heading dates. So let me open both of these. So these are the mixed linear model. And then these are the threshold that was set by the program. Uh, but you can also establish your own threshold. So as you can see in the general linear model, uh, you got a lot of significant peaks for heading dates. So, you know, some people might find it great, but um, because we didn't account for population structure and other stuff in this model, this might be, uh, this likely can contribute to why we see so much association. But let's, let's look at the multi mixed linear model heading dates. Okay, so here in mixed linear model, we see lower peaks, lower number of peaks, just three significant association. And this is because then we account for that uh, population structure using kinship, using population structure. So this can then uh, allow us to remove some of these association that are likely just false positive uh, because we didn't account for them. So overall, we can feel more confident about these uh, peaks that we have identified. But essentially, these are, this is the Manhattan plot. And often you'll see this a lot in your publication. You'll see this a lot in different publications, right? Your different chromosome, your, your negative log of your p-value, okay? So let's look at the QQ plot. So again, we always want to look at the QQ plot because the QQ plot can potentially show us the underlying problem that we might have. So again, I'm going to open QQ plot for the general linear model for heading dates. And we're gonna do QQ plot for the mixed linear model for heading date as well. Okay. So here QQ plot for the general linear model, right? So what do you see here? You see a very, you see, so the no hypothesis again, is that there are no significant association of any of the marker about trade. So the distribution of the p-value should be very close to this red line. But here you see in the GOM model, you see an inflation of the p-value, right? It's away from the line. Uh, so this is this is suggesting to me that uh, there's an inflation of the p-value, right? So it's inflated as away from the, as away from this uh, uh, expected distribution. So this is, this is telling me that we probably did not account, the GOM model probably did not account for the population structure uh, so we're getting these inflation of uh, of p value. But let's look at let's look at a uh, mixed linear model. So this this mixed linear model is what I think is very good uh, in this scenario. As you can see, that we were quite successful in accounting uh, the the p value is not inflated, right? So the p value uh, in this case is very close to the red line that's across, and we have a few p value that are away from the expected, and that's normal because these are uh, the markers that are associated with our trade of interest. Okay, you know, I'm going to clear all the drawings again. So again, you can, you can just just by looking at the QQ plots, you can kind of see whether or not uh, the papers has performed the genome association properly, or maybe they needed to account for more uh, cofactors that can affect um, affects uh, your your uh, your analysis. And again, this this 
this plot would differ between each model. So it might be worthwhile to test out different models to see which one account for these uh, sporadic uh, association better. Um, so another another thing that I want to also talk about is, oh, actually, no, this, these are good. So we're going to move on to the next one. Good, QT plot. So another thing that perhaps is more important for us is, okay, we, we can see the association, but which marker is the peak marker, right? So how do we, how do we find it? Uh, so in this case, we want to look at the GAPIT association GWAS results. In this case, we'll look at the mixed linear model for heading dates. We're not going to look at the general linear model again, again, because we, based on the QQ part, it doesn't seem to be very good. So we're going to look at this one. Okay, we'll give it a minute to load. All right. So these are a very standard output, uh, but they're 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 the information that you need, right? So these are the name of your SNP marker, where which chromosome is it on, which position is it on, the p value, right? So these are the p value. This is uh, the minor allele frequency. Again, uh, we filter out any markers as lower than zero point zero five minor allele frequency, and the number of observations. So how many phenotypic value was included. Um, uh, this can change between markers just because you might have missing data, et cetera. And also this is H and B p-value. So this essentially is your FDR uh, adjusted p-value. And we also have FX size here. So in this case, if you do source and filter, right? So we want to filter for the, I want to identify the lowest p-value. Let's look at it. In this case, the lowest p-value, we got this marker right here on chromosome 15, let's just highlight it. And the p-value passes our significant threshold. I'm oh, sorry, p-value passes our significant threshold. The minor allele frequency looks okay. So this one has a little lower minor allele frequency, but it's still, uh, it's, it's quite good. And then we can also see the effect size. So in this case, uh, I, I have to check which allele they have in the genotyping table. But with this, with a certain allele, you can decrease the, uh, this is heading date, decrease the heading date by five days, which is quite a lot. And for this allele, you can increase heading date by two days, for example. So these are quite big effects allele. So this can help you understand what are the effects of some of these allele. So this is kind of the general overview of the output from the GAPIT. And again, you can go through GAPIT's manual. Uh, uh, so then, um, gap its uh, user manual so they can uh, fully so you can better understand some of these things that I haven't touched on yet but maybe for the last few minutes I really would like uh, or even even by your own or if you want to do it now you can quickly work through the GWAS worksheet that have, that's also included in that folder and it asks you to look at three different questions right you uh, ask you to uh, compare the result from plan high and heading day using different model uh, why does your GOM have more significant association than MLM, right? And for your favorite marker trait association, uh, you want to find the following information necessary, which will be important for your future ex experiment, right? You want to find out uh, the marker name for the strongest associated marker, the p-value, which base pair, where is it located on the chromosome, which chromosome is it? Uh, what are the alleles on it? Is it an A to G conversion? Is it a G to T conversion? And what are the effects of the allele? And in this case, allelic effects uh, in GAP is calculated as the uh, bigger alphabetic, uh, later alphabet minus uh, the A. So if your allelic effect is positive, so it's, in this case, if you have A to T allele, sorry, let me change, change this a little bit. A to T allele is calculated as T minus T, T, T minus A. So if you have a positive number, so let's say five, then you can say the T is the favorable allele for your trait. And if you have a negative allele, uh, then A would be the favorable allele for your trait. But you take a look at these table and see if you can affect, um, see if you can see if you can actually uh, note down these variables and also find genotype that has the positive allele or genotype that has the negative allele because these essentially are the genotype that you can use as your parents for your breeding program, right? If you want to increase heading time, maybe you can use uh, 
maybe you can introduce these allele from some of these parents that carry um, the positive allele. So take, so take a look and see if you can find genotype with positive or negative allele. Okay. So I'll leave this on and I'll, let, I'll give people a few more minutes to work on it and uh, to work on it. Uh, if people want to work on it, they can work on it. And then again, you can find all the result file from that result subfolder that you can download from the link that uh, Adia and Amal has shared. If you have any question, you can type it into the chat. So Vinesh, Vinesh Sharma, Sharma asks, can you please let us know how do we get percent variance explained? So that's a very good question. How do we calculate the percent variance explained. Uh, um, so I think sometimes GWAS model does output that, but I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where to find it, but you can also look to calculate it by looking uh, uh, at conducting a no analysis of variance with, with this marker and your trade of interest. In this case, you can then be able to look at the per percent variance explained by the genotype of this peak marker. And then if you divide it by the total variance, times it by 100, then I think you can calculate for your percent variance explained. Um, but I think there are other tutorials online that you can search on. Um, but yeah, that's a very good question. Can you please share article for creating non-joining tree and LD block? Oh, that's a good point. Um, so I, I don't have any personal, uh, personal, personal script. Uh, so neighbor joining tree, I guess, is looking at the relationship between the lines in your in your uh, in your population, um, let's see. Oh, okay, okay. So someone someone has already beat me to the answer, so that's good. Uh, but but LD block, I think there's the software called Hapo block, which can help you look at linkage LD block within uh, around your significant SNP. I think the software is called uh, Hapo block. Take, take a look. There's also other software that can do it. Um, but essentially, that's just the analysis that's, that I will usually follow up after my GWAS analysis, just to look at how big of the genetic region that I need to need to further investigate. Okay. I see. So I hope people are slowly working through the GWAS worksheet. If you have any question, please feel free to type in the chat. I'll give everyone another five more minutes. In case. Mm. Awesome. That's great. I'm happy to see that uh, you can get all the results now. Good. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, so random the model equal to true. Yep. Yeah. So that's a good point. Random the model equal to true. See, you get a table of percent variance explained. That's great. Uh, Oh yeah, you're welcome. So yeah, so oh please, the script for LD plot. Uh, so again, I would, I would, uh, I think, uh, I would try out the software Hapo block. Is it possible to share the recording? I think the recording is gonna be the on the YouTube channel of the Tunis R user group. So if you can find the YouTube channel, feel free. I think you can either email their group again. I think they'll be more than happy to share the link towards a YouTube channel. But yeah, this session will be recorded. Uh, I Sorry, this session is recorded and we do have the recording. Yeah, we'll send at the end the link to the YouTube channel. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, great, great. Oh, good that it's working for some of you. Good, good. I'm very glad it works. Uh, no.
uh, what is the input file? So I think the input file, you have to input um, uh, the surrounding genes, uh, surrounding marker genotyping file. Uh, but I think they need to use another format. The, the, the HAPO, HAPO, yeah, HAPO view has a, has a very interesting formatting. But I think another participant was mentioning that you can use Plink to convert between these HAP, uh, to convert between these formats. And I think you can also use Tassel to, to get the format that you need. Okay. So does, does anyone have the answer to maybe, let's see if anyone has the answer to, to this question, to this part of the, to this part of the session? Is anyone able to identify uh, the peak SNP for heading dates and then look at the allelic effect and maybe uh, identify genotype that positive allele? Does anyone have the answer to that at the moment? Those are people still working on it? No, okay. But essentially the answer for the first two question, uh, I think I just want to illustrate that you see more association in the GOM in comparison to a mixed linear model. Uh, and this is likely because some of these association you find with the GOM model is, uh, is a false positive. And you, you can see that from the QQ plot where you see an inflation of the, of the p-value from the no hypothesis as to where in mixed linear model, you have there's a few marker at the end uh, uh, that shows significance. So that's good. Okay. If anyone else has has the answer for 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 this section, they can type it into the chat. Uh, if not, I'm gonna assume people are doing well. Uh, if you have any question, also type it into the chat. If not, I'm gonna assume that you're doing great. Uh, okay, and then we also have the link to our to the YouTube channel on here as well. That's great. And we're just going to give another uh, people another few minutes and we'll probably end our session here on uh, just another few minutes so people can have another chance to see whether or not they can answer these questions. Okay, so it doesn't look like uh, people have any additional question. Um, so uh, I think that's good. It seems like people are getting on well. Um, so I think uh, I would just end my session here. And again, as Amal and the idea, I said that the, this, uh, this tutorial is recorded. So feel free uh, to revisit this video uh, if, you, if, you, if you need uh, to... Uh, to clarify some of the information. And I'm very, again, very happy uh, to be invited by Tunis R user group to be able to deliver this workshop today. And I hope uh, at the very least you can, uh, you have learned something new that you can apply to your own study later on in your, in solving some of the problem that we're tackling in this world at the moment. And thank you all for being so respectful uh, in the sessions. So thank you Andy very much. So, and, uh... We'll send you the solution 
or is, is the solution like in the zip file andy yeah we we can we can i i can i can write up the solution but i really want people to to give it a go making sure they can interpret some of these results yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Actually, we'll wait like one week and yeah, we we'll send you the solution so you can work on that. So thank you very much for attending this session. And please, we will share the recording on our YouTube channel. And we, yeah, don't forget to email us if you have any issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much. Bye. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming to our workshop last week. So I hope you had the chance to uh, work on the solution of the problem set that I provided. So there were uh, three problems in total. Uh, so today I'm going to go over some of the solutions and then um, and you can double check whether or not you get it right. So the first question was walk through the follow to quickly compare your results for plan high and heading day from different model. So we had a chance to run GWAS and GAPHIT using the general linear model and a mixed linear model. And we wanna see what difference do you see between them? Uh, so for the answer of this question, uh, essentially I just want uh, people to look at the results, the Manhattan plot. Uh, so here I'll use heading dates as an example. So here you can see for the general linear model, you're seeing a lot more significant peak across the entire genome, right? So just by, so this is your significant threshold. So you can see a lot, a lot of peaks across different part of the chromosome. Whereas in your mixed linear model, you see just three uh, peaks that pass the significance threshold on chromosome 13, 15, and 20. So you can see that uh, mixed linear model had way less uh, significant market trade association uh, for GOM. And we can find out why that is uh, by answering question number two. So number, question number two, the question was, why does GOM have more significant association than mixed linear model? And my hint was to take a look at the QQ plot. So here you can see for the general linear model. Uh, so here again, this is a no hypothesis. Uh, so a no hypothesis is that uh, there's no significant association between marker and our trade of interest. Uh, so if that is true, then most of the uh, dots should be along this red line, but you can see an inflation of this uh, p-value. So QQ plot is, is just is to look at the distribution of the p-value. So you can see this inflation of p-value right here. And this will suggest that there is uh, uh, a lot of false positive, and this can be due to population structure uh, within your population that are not accounted by your model, uh, which is often the problem when you're using general linear model. Um, we also look at mixed linear model. Uh, so in, in our mixed linear model, we use population structure that we got from PCA and also uh, the kinship value that was provided by Gapit to run our model. And you can here you can see that we the most of the p-values are along the uh, the red line. Uh, where we have a few p-value that deviate from the red line, suggesting a significant association. So overall, this is kind of the pattern that we're looking for, and we suggest that mixed linear model are better at accounting, uh, are better at removing false positive uh, from the genome-wide association study. Uh, so it essentially, uh, GON likely just have more association because um, uh, because the model does not. Uh, probably account for population structure. And therefore, most of the association that we see here are likely false positive. And so and in my personal opinion, I, I I would be more confident in pursuing some of these market share association that I found using the uh, mixed linear model. So, so for the third question, we wanted to look at, uh, to kind of, get some of these information that you might need for further follow-up study for, or for your marker development uh, from your from, from your GWAS study. Okay, so I asked you to look at, uh, to gather some of these data uh, from um, the significant association that you see in an analysis. So I'll use the height example. Uh, so 
for height, uh, the most significant peak is, oh, I don't have the graph here, but you can take a look at your results yourself. The most significant peak should be on uh, chromosome 1B or chromosome 2 in the coding. And this is where the significant marker is located. It's around uh, 410 million base pair. The name of the marker is this. And the p-value uh, is this right here. And you can find all these information uh, by looking at the gap width, gap hit association GWAS result table, right? Uh, so you can, you can just filter out uh, the p-value by the smallest and then you'll be able to find a similar in information. And here, if you go back to the initial genotyping data, you can find out which uh, which SNP that the uh, the axion chip is genotyping for. So in this case, it's T or C, and the allylic effect is four point seven four. So allylic effect is calculated by, uh, in this case, the later alphabetical letter minus the earlier alphabetical letter based on their alphabetical order. So in this case, it's T minus C is 4.74. So the taller allele is T and the shorter allele uh, is C. So you can see that these accessions have uh, uh, contain the allele that's associated with taller height. And these are the accessions that have the allele that's associated with shorter height. And then you can then use this information to de develop, uh, for example, cast markers in order to uh, introgress uh, this high allele into your germplasm, um, or potentially um, you can then, uh, yeah, uh, you, you can um, use these parents. You can also use this information to select uh, which which line you want to use uh, to perform your back crossing. Uh, so for example, I might want to use the line with the name this uh, to introduce this taller allele into my germplasm. So in short, that's the answers for the exercise uh, that we have looked at uh, for this genome-wide association study. Um, but before I go, again, I just want to thank uh, the Tunis R Working Group for such a great opportunity um, to deliver this workshop and also to thank Dr. Lucy Wingen, who has uh, kindly provided the practical data sets. Uh, so she currently work, She currently is a research associate at the John Innes Center. And thank you all for listening. I'll talk to you next time.